Under the trees, several pheasants lay about, their rich plumage dabbled with blood. Some were dead, some feebly twitching a wing, some staring up at the sky, some pulsating quickly, some contorted, some stretched out, all of them writhing in agony except the fortunate ones whose tortures had ended during the night by the inability of nature to bear more. With the impulse of a soul who could feel for kindred sufferers as much as for herself, Tess's first thought was to put the still living birds out of their torture. And to this end, with her own hand, she broke the necks of as many as she could find, leaving them to lie where she had found them till the gamekeepers should come, as they probably would come, to look for them a second time. Poor darlings, to suppose myself the most miserable being on earth in sight of such misery as yours, she exclaimed, her tears running down as she killed the birds tenderly. Thomas Hardy, Tess of the D'Urbervilles. Hello, my name is Mage, and welcome to Black and White Thinking, a place where I like to talk about bisexuality, women's representation in media and literature, mythology, mental health issues, and DC Comics. Today's video combines all of those things that I love to research and rant about the most. In today's video, we are going to be talking about the green goddess of Gotham City, Poison Ivy herself, and in the simplest terms, we are going to be taking a look back at the history of one Pamela Isley through the lens of feminist, film, and folklore theories, which I promise, or at least I hope, is actually more fun than I just made it sound. Poison Ivy is a character whose influence is large and whose existence is polemic, to put it politely. A character created by men to represent women in a very specific way. She is a character who is both grounded in the reality of a woman's struggle against the patriarchy and also in the anger and venom that is connected with such an existence. She is also a character rooted in mythology and godlike power. Ivy's existence is a divinely feminine one, explored by almost exclusively male bards. She is archetypal, and arguably an agent of bigger conversations and representations than that of simply being a Batman villainess. DC has a few of these characters, larger than life, representative of an important part of the American zeitgeist, informed by mythology and written by men. So what makes Ivy different from, say, Wonder Woman or Superman? Well, that's kind of why I'm here, and that's what I hope to explore in this video, and that's where theory comes in. Ivy is a character whose connection to mythology, misogyny, and madness makes her a femme fatale like no other. Ivy as a character, in my opinion, can help us understand the past and present cultural views of feminism and female liberation, especially as we move through the passage of time unravelling her history. As I said, Ivy is a character rooted in misogynistic images, written by men and marketed at men, and yet she is still a character with enormous feminine power and a character many women, including myself, identify with. Both reactionary and relatable, both masculine and feminine, the beautiful and the monstrous, Ivy is a goddess of old, a woman out of time, connected to the same archetypal women who came before her and those that will come afterwards too. Ivy is the recreation of ancient images of women, the green goddess, the great cosmic mother, the May Queen, the mother, the maiden, the crone, the damsel in distress, all the way to the destructive demon. And Ivy is consistently categorized in these images by men at least a very specific class of men, and, well, that's not just feminist junk science on my behalf. Poison Ivy as a character, as a woman who has represented feminist rage in the DC universe, has almost exclusively been written by men across her 60-year history. All of these aspects of Ivy's existence weave together to paint a story of not only woman as goddess, but woman as goddess as seen through the eyes of men. A queer feminist woman at that, the fascinating, almost paradoxical feminism of Poison Ivy, her connection to ancient images and mythology, and to the strange way in which DC has chosen to use her over the years, all personally fascinate me to no end. Her story is one that has been told before, and one I wish to share with you all. So grab a tankard, as we trace a mythological thread through the ups, the downs, and the many-faced origins of Poison Ivy. 
you enjoy this video please consider subscribing to the channel giving it a like letting me know what you think and checking out my other links below thanks as always One, what is the male gaze? Now the first theory I want to address is one that I imagine almost everyone who will be watching this video will have heard of. Actually, I kind of imagine like this collective groan from you all when I mention it, to be perfectly honest. However, it is a phrase that has been separated from its original theoretical meaning within colloquial language and internet discourse, so I want to revisit its definitions, as I will be using it a lot throughout this video. It has been impossible to approach Ivy's history through a feminist perspective without acknowledging the male gaze theory. It has arguably impacted almost every iteration of Ivy's character. The male gaze is a visual theory, genuinely seen to have been popularised within film theory circles by Laura Mulvey in her 1975 essay, Visual Pleasures and Narrative Cinema. The piece is a psychoanalytical second wave feminist look at how we interact with women presented on screen. My shift in spectatorship came very suddenly and specifically out of the influence of the women's movement. The male gaze theory, as Mulvey describes it in her essay, is essentially the heteronormative portrayal of women within narrative cinema as objects, sexual ones, who exist for the pleasure of the heterosexual male viewer. Mulvey outlines three perspectives of the male gaze in her essay. The first, the gaze of the man behind the camera, the director. The second, the gaze of the male characters within the narrative. And three, the gaze of the spectators of the film. Both male and female perspectives to the male gaze would be considered in Mulvey's essay, and she would question the complicity of women in the consumption of male-dominated cinema. For Ivy, we have her creators, her writers. We have the men in the narrative with her, the Jason Woodrows, the Batmans, the Jokers. And then there are us, the spectators of Ivy. The male gaze, whilst popular in film theory, is translatable to basically every other medium and has been a foundation for many theories before and after the publishing of Mulvey's essay. Men dream of women. Women dream of themselves being dreamt of. Men look at women. Women watch themselves being looked at. constantly meet glances which act like mirrors, reminding them of how they look or how they should look. Behind every glance is a judgment. Sometimes the glance they meet is their own, reflected back from a real mirror. Perhaps even then, by her own image of herself. While she is walking across a room, or weeping at the death of her father, she cannot avoid envisaging herself walking or weeping. From earliest childhood, she is taught and persuaded to survey herself continually. She has to survey everything she is and everything she does, because how she appears to others, and particularly how she appears to men, is of crucial importance for what is normally thought of as the success of her life. The first use of the phrase, the male gaze, that I'm aware of from my research is actually from one of my favourite pieces of media ever, John Berger's 1972 film series, Ways of Seeing, that would later be formatted into a book. The video I just shared is from this series. I read and watched Ways of Seeing years ago, I reread it for fun last year whilst recommending it to a friend, and I reread it again for this piece. It's really not very long, like less than 100 pages, and I highly recommend it. I think it is a must watch or read for anyone who is interested in the visual arts. It's free to watch on YouTube and available to buy in paperback, so I will link both versions below. Also just like message me if you want a copy. John Berger was an art critic and he was a good one. 
His understanding of visual media and his ability to talk about it remains unchallenged, in my opinion. In Ways of Seeing, Berger explains the root of the male gaze in media and literature and art by connecting it to the commodification of women. The male gaze is simply about woman as object, woman as other, especially in media, lit, or in Berger's case, art especially in cultures that exist within the boundaries of a patriarchal framework. And as Mulvey's work is inspired by Berger, among other people like Lacan and even Freud, Berger's work is clearly influenced by the work of feminist philosophers and theorists that came before him, included but not limited to Simone de Beauvoir, who said in her 1949 book, The Second Sex, within the human collectivity, nothing is natural and woman, among other, is a product developed by civilization. The male gaze, the way in which I will be using it in this video, provides us with simply a foundation to start from in understanding Ivy and her very patriarchal male-influenced history at DC Comics. The male gaze leads us to simply ask, why? Why are women betrayed the way they are? On screen, in books, on stage. The male gaze leads us to theoretically understand the use of certain archetypes, such as the femme fatale, the vamp, and the black widow. It allows us to analyse the persistent images of women we are all exposed to frequently and forever, and question the roots behind them. Male as in patriarchal, as in the role men and mask people are forced to play, not male as in you, a male specifically watching this right now. One of the ways Berger and Mulvey connect their ideas is through how they describe both the male and the female gaze. The female gaze in this discussion is not just like pink aesthetic, it's usually an extension of the male gaze, influenced by it, a way women seek to fetishise their own objectification. Another one of the things that Mulvey and Berger both touch on is how the male gaze associates women with things. They are not themselves, but the products and trinkets that they are surrounded by. Men are their name and their morality. They are what it means to be a man. Then explain to me why you will because not- Because it is my name! Because I cannot have another in my life! Because I lie and sign myself to lies! Because I am not worth the dust on the feet of them you have hanged. Women are objectified through aesthetics and literal objects. What it means to be a woman comes down to a lot of aesthetic things, especially in visual mediums. Makeup and jewellery are a great example of this. If you take a look at how women wear makeup and jewellery in their average day-to-day -day existence, and then you compare it to the depictions of women wearing makeup and jewellery in male-created art and literature, you can tend to see the expansiveness of woman as object. A woman is a thing made up of other things. As Berger explains it, men act and women appear. Men look at women, women watch themselves being looked at. This determines not only most relations between men and women, but also the relation of women to themselves. The surveyor of woman in herself is male, the surveyed is female, thus she turns herself into an object, a vision, a sight. Which is what Mulvey said, it's what de Beauvoir said, it's a branch of philosophical French feminism that I don't want to get into right now. But visual images are a language, and a lot of feminists would argue, or at least point out, that a lot of modern language, especially visual language, is controlled and created by patriarchal systems. It's hard to unoppress yourself when you are using the oppressor's language. Whilst talking about myth and the male gaze in an essay expanding on her ideas in visual pleasures, Laura Mulvey uses Pandora's box as an example of an object that walks hand in hand with the woman it objectifies. She talks about how the box is a metaphor for Pandora herself, like the secrets of femininity that hide within women that men cannot unravel without tearing open. Laura Mulvey also points out the very literal and obvious sexual imagery of, like, a box. For Ivy, I see this recreated in her relationships with plants and flowers. Snake-like vines worthy of Lilith and Eve, blossoming buds that look like vaginas, and the desperate need to prune and save something that can never really love her back. Mulvey describes Pandora as condensing different topographies of femininity. 
themes of femininity that unravel into strands but link together like the rings in a chain. For me that perfectly describes the imagery and effect of Ivy through the years, especially when we look at how she weaves herself comparatively to the other women of the DC universe. In Ways of Seeing, John Berger uses a lot of European art in order to explain his views around the male gaze, and this in itself is something deeply connected to Ivy. Ivy is often depicted as something worthy of a Romantic Era portrait. Ivy is often drawn as an idol, a thing to be worshipped, as a goddess. 2. Who is the Triple Goddess? In 1948, English-Irish poet Robert Graves released his speculative and pseudo-historical essay, so big it was a book, named The White Goddess. The White Goddess is a controversial piece of literature, but it is seminal in the field of what has come to be known generally as goddess studies, or the study of goddess theories. Goddess studies tend to be a collection of ideas from many different scholars and writers and philosophers from the past 300-ish years that all have completely different opinions on how mythology works. It is simply the philosophical and literary exploration of ideas surrounding goddess worship and mythology throughout human history. Not to be confused with the Great Goddess Hypothesis, which posits a historical theory that human worship began as matriarchal and monotheistic. The man we're talking about, Robert Graves, did actually believe in the Great Goddess Hypothesis as well, which makes things a little confusing. The White Goddess, the book, is for lack of a better description, a mythological wank stream, documenting a bisexual veteran's trauma through the lens of half historic and half poetic insights into goddess worship around the world, specifically within ancient European civilization. It is an ode, a poem, to an image, an archetype, a ghost that personally haunts Graves, which he names the White Goddess. At the age of 46, Graves once again buried himself in his writing. It was then that he began to explore the link between his creativity and his feelings of terror, awe, and devotion. He embodied these emotions into a physical form, the divine being who demanded sacrifice in exchange for the fire of creative inspiration. His literary muse, one he connects to ancient poets and the ancient deities they worshipped. He believed that being in a state of deep emotion and writing purely for the white goddess was his place of divinity. He was arguably also quite an unwell man, even if he was a wonderful writer. And amongst his chaotic ramblings, Graves would often portray a hint of truth. A truth he portrays through concept and theme, if not through science and prose. For this video, for our exploration of Poison Ivy, Graves is essentially relevant for two reasons. One, in regards to the understanding of archetypes and new language that formed to describe goddess imagery. It has all been overwhelmingly inspired by Graves' essay. And two, because he's a man, albeit not a heterosexual man, but he is a man whose life's work is a piece about the holiness and worshipability of women. Like Ivy's existence, Graves' work is paradoxically feminist and super male gazy. And again, his work has inspired so many people to have come afterwards, even if they don't know it. The specific language and imagery inspired by Graves that is relevant to us is that of the Triple Goddess. Like Young or Campbell, Graves was obsessed with archetypes, and being that he was a poet, his named archetypes tended to be more poetic than psychoanalytical. One of these archetypes that would worm its way out of the white goddess and into feminist, neo-pagan, and literary spaces is the triple goddess. Or more specifically, the mother, a maiden, and the crone. The white goddess, to graves, was mythologically and metaphorically the moon. The moon's phase of waxing full and waning would become metaphors for the cycle of a goddess's life. Other male writers, such as Carl Jung or Carl Karenyi or Eric Newman, would also write about the Triple Goddess as an archetype. Women like Jane Ellen Harrison and Marija Gambautas, who would specifically write a lot about the triple-faced moon goddess, would also help cement this idea of the Triple Goddess into the collective consciousness. Graves is the one people tend to remember because he was genuinely convinced he was writing about truth, not archetype, but the ideas are all the same. And well, he's also remembered because he is a man, which is relevant to this essay. And whilst the existence of things like whether or not we once lived in a utopian matriarchy 
we didn't. Or whether three-faced goddesses existed throughout cultures that had never met, they did and do. The image, the connection, the archetype of the triple goddess penetrated culture and literature in a hundred different ways after the white goddess was published. And so what actually is a triple goddess? Well, it's three archetypes for the price of one. The maiden is new beginnings, youth and naivety, deadly beauty with a whimsical nature. The mother is fire and fertility and rage. Sex and births, nourishment and energy, all the power and the best of life and the seasons. The crone is wisdom and respect, death and rebirth, dark nights and tranquil dreams and solemn endings. Or to quote Graves himself, as goddess of the underworld, she was concerned with birth, procreation, and death. As goddess of the earth, she was concerned with the three seasons of spring, summer, and winter. She animated trees and plants and ruled all living creatures. As goddess of the sky, she was the moon. In her three phases of new moon, full moon, and waning moon, as the new moon or spring, she was a girl. As the full moon or summer, she was woman. As the old moon or winter, she was hag. The triple goddess archetype is easily spotted in media. You'll sometimes see it called a Hecate trio. Sometimes you'll see these three archetypes exist within one character, rather than three. The Wizard of Oz is a great example of Mother Maiden Crone. Glinda Mother, Dorothy Maiden, Witch of the West Grey. Anything written by Neil Gaiman, including Ivy herself, but we'll get there, we will probably have a reference to the triple goddess. Lord of the Rings. Eowyn Maiden, Arwen Mother, Galadriel Crone. Game of Thrones, Daenerys Mother, Daenerys Maiden, Daenerys Crone or Sansa Maiden's Danny Mother, Cersei Crone, Will of Time, Gwen Maiden, Nynaeve Mother, Moraine Crone, The Gotham City Sirens, Harley Maiden, Selina Mother, Ivy Crone, or Selina Crone, Ivy Mother, they tend to swap. Fantasy likes to overplay this trope. A lot. Fantasy likes to overplay this trope so much it becomes a cliche. This understanding of three-faced female deities, or three-faced archetypes, was not one that Graves invented. He simply recognised it, wrote it down, and added a bunch of random thoughts about how nice tits are. This motif is one we see in Hecate, the Threefold Goddess, or the Greia, or the Furies, all from ancient Greece. We see her in Inanna, Queen of Heaven, from ancient Sumer, even in Shakespeare's Macbeth. It is one that can be traced through our human history, and it is one that we can see play out in literature of old and new. At the beginning of this video, I quoted one of my favourite books, written by a man, Thomas Hardy, about a woman, Tess Durbeyfield. Tess of the D'Urbervilles is a Victorian novel, long before Graves' time that enacts exactly the images he would come to discuss. Men and women world over have not only come to recognise Graves' named archetypes in mythology, but they have also recreated this old image, one that Graves himself thought was a recreation of, of ancient goddess worship at its core, good, bad, and ugly. Margaret Atwood hates the triple goddess. She thinks the archetype is sexist and informed far too much by a male perception of women rather than what women authentically are. Some women literally worship the Triple Goddess as her own deity, finding comfort in the connecting images repeated throughout history that they see as unifying the feminine in a world of masculine things. I'm not here to argue the good or the bad of these archetypes, but I hope you will all see going forward, Graves and the Triple Goddess influence reaches well into the boundaries of Gotham City. There are also many other goddess motifs that have influenced Ivy's character throughout history. Poison, flowers and herbs, locks of fire, the literal cycles of life and death, the general toxicity of women, the May Queen, bisexuality and the great sensuality of nature are all things that can be seen to connect deities through archetype. They are all things, like the Triple Goddess, that have been used by men metaphorically playing God in Ivy's creation. Like the White Goddess is Robert Graves' muse, and his love for that muse created a wave of women who saw something in his work that, let's be real, a lot of other people don't get. So does Ivy stand as Gotham's goddess, the Green Goddess, serving as a muse, an outlet, a reflection, for those that write her. And I am very much here to argue that as we study Ivy's stories, when you break down individual eras and compare them to the feminist zeitgeist in America at the time, you can pinpoint how Ivy moves through her own Mother Maiden Crone cycle. Interlude 1. A note on the femme fatale. So I think the ideas expressed by Mulvey and Berger, and ones raised by people like Graves, come to meet in the old femme fatale trope. The femme fatale is an archetype, a stock character, a dare I say cliché. 
The femme fatale is a trope employed repeatedly by male creators throughout art and literature. It is one of the most obvious examples of a trope that has been utilised beneath the male gaze. Even women who are writing and drawing and playing femme fatales are still recreating images that were created by men. And the femme fatale is the goddess archetype, right? Every deity of femme persuasion is actually a femme fatale. Goddesses generally have power, even agency sometimes, which is why they are perceived as so deadly. The femme fatale, like the triple goddess, and also quite often in the same persona, began in antiquity and can be traced through art up until this day. Medusa, Lilith, Kali, the Vamp, the Man-Eater, the Witch, Enchantress, Temptress, the French Artists, Vengeful Muse, the Stocking-Wearing Pin-Up Girl, the Sadistic Sexual Deviant. You can have your Maiden Fatale, your Mother Fatale, and your Crone Fatale. I believe they all very much exist in their own right. All aspects of the Mother, Maiden, Crone archetype can exist within the realms of the Femme Fatale. We'll talk about this more as we go on, but in my opinion, Maiden femme fatales can be seen to be reflected in characters like Ophelia from Shakespeare's Hamlet, or even Kathy from Wuthering Heights. I read a great essay about Ivy that discusses a lot of these ideas, and I wish I could quote the whole thing for you, but I'm not going to. I'll link it below though. Dr. Victoria Tedeschi's Poison Ivy, Red in Tooth and Claw, Ecocentrism and Ecofeminism in the DC Universe. In this essay, Dr. Tedeschi comments that Poison Ivy's predatory sexuality marks her as one of Batman's most formidable enemies. Ivy is a dramatisation of the femme fatale archetype, bringing ruin to men who fall for her charms. Since her inception, she has been reimagined as a sexualized serial killer, a black widow, and a prostitute. Filtered through the lens of the male gaze, Poison Ivy's sexual freedom is equated with female deviancy. Through her constant evasion and dismissal of patriarchal systems and heteronormative codes, Poison Ivy exists as a male fantasy that can never be actualised, and consequently serves as an example of unbridled female power who must be punished, dominated, or at the very least, controlled. And Ivy truly, visually, is one of the most distinctive and recognisable femme fatales of the last century. This is a little off topic, but I personally believe in a thousand years time, some archaeologist is going to be digging up Superman comics and thinking we worshipped an alien journalist. Superhero universes are myth unto themselves. Through repetition and pure fucking accident, DC Comics has created a mythos that rivals that of Lovecraft and Cthulhu. Ivy's basis in the femme fatale image is not only obvious when you compare her original design with a photograph of, say, Betty Page, but also when you take a closer look at how Ivy is drawn and portrayed throughout her history, especially when you compare those images of Ivy to images of portraits and paintings from male artists who were famous specifically for their femme fatale art. And like, I'm no art historian, but I do have eyes, and it's pretty easy to see how repeating images of women can be created. If you look at the work of Franz von Stuck or Gustav Klimt, John William Warthouse or John Collier, all men who are known for their work painting their lovers as mythical femme fatales, and then you compare those images to panels of ivy throughout the years, I would argue you can see a direct, even if unintentional, ode from one to the other. And it's pretty telling how prominent these images are in society, how artists just innately know, almost, how to portray such archetypes. Young would have a field day. As Laura Mulvey puts it, popular cultures, myths, iconographies, narratives could be understood as having a symptomatic relationship to the repressions and obsessions of the societies that generated them. The femme fatale is a symbol of patriarchal male anxiety, and Ivy represents male anxiety in Gotham the same way that Batman would represent the male ego. Again, this whole thing is very youngian. And here's a too long didn't read. Uma Thurman is unintentionally going to come up a lot in this video, but a great example of a story that encompasses all the elements I'm talking about, the mother, the maiden, the crone, the femme fatale, and the male gaze, is Kill Bill, and specifically the character of the bride. 3. Ivy is Maiden and the Second Way Would not the earth, quickened to an evil purpose by the sympathy of his eye, greet him with poisonous shrubs? Would he not suddenly sink into the earth, leaving a barren and blasted spot where, in due course of time, would be seen deadly nightshade, dogwood, henbane, and whatever else of vegetable wickedness the climate could produce, all flourishing with hideous luxuriance? Nathaniel Hawthorne, The Scarlet Letter So it's 1966, the year Star Trek first aired on television, and Batman starring Adam West too. 
NASA launches its first successful lunar orbiter. England wins the World Cup. I think it's all over. It is now. And roundabouts are invented. Lyndon B. Johnson is America's president, and in June of 66, a certain actor enters politics and becomes governor of California. Biggest shot in the arm for the American Republican Party, the election of Ronald Reagan as governor of California. It is also in the June 66 edition of Detective Comics Batman, issue 181, where the world would be first introduced to Poison Ivy, who would be both foe and lover to the Cape Crusader. Created by Robert Kanier and Sheldon Moldoff, Rumour has it that Ivy, and for some reason it's remarkably hard to find any original quotes from either of Ivy's creators. Rumour has it that Poison Ivy was created not just as an antagonist slash lover for Batman, but she was made to serve as an alternate for Batman's first femme fatale, our beloved Catwoman. Ivy would serve as the flora of Fatal to Selina's fauna, and with that, one of Batman's greatest foes, a woman with an opinion, would be set in place for the rest of Bat history. Now, as much as I don't want to begin this discussion on Ivy by talking about her looks, her looks, the way she was drawn and formed by her creators, has a pretty big bearing on her character. When creating Poison Ivy, Moldoff would famously use Betty Page as inspiration. Betty Page was a pinup, the queen of pinups, supposedly in the 50s. As she grew older and less marketable, Page was famous for getting involved in crime and being mentally ill. She is one of those old Hollywood tales of misery, another Marilyn Monroe or Doris Day, an old Hollywood starlet who was very much abused by people who basically sold her body for money. When she wasn't making that money anymore, those people abandoned her. And well, now Betty's image is used to sell comics. Anyway, Ivy's physical beauty was important from the offset. It was arguably, and unfortunately, the most important thing about her in the beginning. Ivy's sexuality and sensuality were based heavily on not only real women, but the very real images of women that are created through things like art, porn, advertisements. Ivy was a body long before she was a person. In her first outing in the Batverse, Ivy, in her inherent femme fatale villainess ways, comes into the scene to stir up trouble between Batman and Robin. After all the comments on the possible queerness between the now famous father-son duo back in the day, Bob Kane, the creator of Batman, wanted to create as much feminine mischief as possible in the men's lives to keep the audience on the straight path, quite literally. If you want to know more about Bob Kane's homophobia and how it has had a lasting effect on the universe Batman exists in, I briefly touch on it in my DC Comics Doesn't Care About LGBT People video. And there are lots more sources for DC-related drama in that video's description. Ivy's image was influenced by the pinup girl, but the origins of her story can be found in far more romantic places. Romantic with a capital R. Romanticism, often referring to a very specific era in Europe or the movements of works it has inspired, is basically a school of philosophical thought. A literary and art-based movement, usually labelled with the old, you'll know it when you see it, Byron and shit. Romanticism essentially served as a movement that was focused on the artistic and so-called beautiful qualities of the individual. It's basically, everyone has a story to tell, with some added orientalism, an obsession with poetry and mythology, and gothic aesthetics. At least classically within the Romantic period. Romanticism would continue, however, to inspire many writers long after the period was over. Romanticism is the same movement that would eventually give us people like Young and Graves and Campbell and archetypal and goddess studies. Romantic art appealed to the emotions, in particular the emotion of fear and the exhilaration aroused by storm, bloodshed and ferocity. It was prepared to use any means to heighten the emotional effect of a picture strong colour, violent contrasts of light and shade, and a positive delight in the exaggerated movement that the theorists of classical art deplored. It was a far from perfect movement, and was mostly encompassed in upper class English art and literature, but it has been staggeringly important. A love for nature and art and people. This is the story of man's escape from the shackles of commerce and industry to the freedom of nature at a time when the world was becoming increasingly mechanised, the Romantics sought an intense relationship with the natural world. In so doing, they would revolutionise our perception of life itself. 
It's a little complicated to pin down exactly what romanticism is, but regardless of what it is, it very much influenced Ivy's story. And honestly, in my opinion, Gotham stuff generally. Romanticism is a predecessor to an understanding of things like the male gaze. The romanticism movement was very much founded on principles and ideas that came from men, even if women can be romantics, and very much were, again, capital R. And romanticism lends itself to the gothic, to the noir, and that has obviously influenced all of Gotham history. 200 years ago, monarchy was falling to the power of people's revolutions. Industry and commerce were becoming the driving forces of existence, and advances in science were changing the way life itself was understood. Artists all over the world were inspired by these times of dramatic change. In Britain, a group of poets and novelists pioneered an alternative way of living and of looking at the world. Rappuccini's Daughter is a gothic short story from 1844, written by Nathaniel Hawthorne, famous for having written The Scarlet Letter. The story follows a scientist, a botanist who creates magical poisonous plants that he, long story short, exposes to his daughter. This makes her poisonous, and men come to fear her, but also admire her effervescent beauty. One day she falls for one of these men, and bad things happen to her when she makes a failed attempt to cure herself. Daughter and lover, Adam and Eve. Overlord Father, the Vengeful God. The story had a clear influence on Ivy's creation, and this reference in itself, the one Kanaya makes to Hawthorne, is a fair reflection of the re-emergence of romantic imagery post-World War II. The hippie and the femme fatale meeting to create something that mirrored the titular character of Hawthorne's work, the male obsession with female deities the original story is founded in, as well as the emerging eco-feminist consciousness of the 1970s. Ivy's existence is one carved by men, a very specific type of man at that, and that cannot really be ignored in the understanding of how her character works and the purpose she serves in the Batverse. This is not me trying to make a political statement. Comic books have been enjoyed by a vast and multi-gendered audience for decades, but big comic players like Marvel and obviously DC have historically hired white male employees of a very specific social demographic. As recently as 2014, men working for DC Comics outnumbered women 9 to 1, and 79% that year were white. I definitely think we have made a little progress since then, but not enough. One study from 2018 found that only 17.2% of all creators in DC Comics were women, and historically this has been a big issue. Women of all kinds, people of colour, and anyone without a college education has been purposely cut off from writing for these companies. This affects all the material that has come out of these places. It can't not. And it definitely has had a lasting touch on the character of Poison Ivy. From the original femme fatale inspiration and the ogling eye of Bob Kane and his friends, all the way down to the manic pixie mother of Neil Gaiman. Men living underneath the patriarchy, as long as Ivy has existed, have used her to tell the story of the other. The story of how they relate and interact with the realities they have found themselves living in. Inadvertently or not, Ivy is probably the most mean depiction of a woman in the DC universe, clearly created in retaliation to the second wave feminist movement in the US. And you know, hussies. Hi there. I'd like to humiliate some hussies and I'm in a hurry. <laughs> The 60s and 70s were a huge time for English-speaking feminism, especially in the US. The quality of the movement varied, and it was far from perfect, but second-wave feminism, fronted by the likes of Gloria Steinem, and starting somewhere just after Simone de Beauvoir, and ending somewhere around Bell Hooks, had a lasting effect on the world over, and more specifically, the cultural zeitgeist and responses around feminism at the time, again, specifically in the USA. That's my cat sneezing. I mean, I cannot overstate how wild the 60s were for the United States. Feminism became mainstream, being pursued in media, in academics, in the law. Abortion rights were protested, the ethics of sex work questioned, and people began to acknowledge the scale of IPV because certain women and their allies were mouthy and got really good at protesting. There were a lot of protests in the 60s, anti-war protests, civil rights protests, pro-black demonstrations that were infiltrated by the police. It was a time. And naturally, in regards to things like feminism, there were responses to this. The good, the bad, and the ugly. 
and so enter DC Comics and Poison Ivy. Ivy, as I just said, seems to reflect how usually male, usually middle to upper class, usually white writers reflect the women of their time. A lot of characters end up this way regardless of a writer's intention. However, it's kind of hard to argue against Ivy having been invented in a responsive manner, at least in my opinion. The second wave feminist movement in the US really had its initial gains between 63 and 66. Ivy came into the world in 66. As I said, the early 60s were a crazy time for the US generally. This is a time amidst both the invasion of Vietnam and the Cold War. In August 62, Marilyn Monroe dies. The same year, The Silent Spring by Rachel Carson is published, a book considered to have inspired most of the 60s eco-movement. In 63, Gloria Steinem writes her expose on Playboy magazine, exposing their misogynistic working conditions. Angela Davis is first questioned by the FBI about being a communist, and Betty Friedan wrote The Feminine Mystique. The March on Washington, with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech and Kennedy's assassination were also all in 63. 64 was Johnson signing the Civil Rights Act, and in 66, the year of Ivy's first appearance, the National Coalition for Women was created in America. The mood around equality was changing. People were angry, in quotes, on all sides, and this was very much reflected in a lot of the art produced at the time. The writer of Poison Ivy, Robert K. Nyer, was a Jewish son of immigrants who was said to have an incredible work ethic, but was known to be a total ass to work with in the office. The guy who first drew her, Sheldon Modoff, was fired only a year after the fact for daring to ask DC for better health and retirement benefits. Bob Kane, the original Batman writer, also left the company in 66, so Ivy was never really in their hands for very long. In pre-crisis DC, the 60s, the 70s, and the early 80s, women, especially women outside of Wonder Woman, are kind of the opposite of liberated. Batman and his dark, desolate city capture women like flies, and more often than not, destroy them. Batman had to be seen as the ultimate man, at least metaphorically, biting off the queers in too much makeup and the women daring to ask for liberation. In my opinion, Ivy's literal maiden voyage is one that can be seen as a reflection of the maiden archetype, one step away from a damsel in distress. The damsel in distress, but like, really sexy. The young girl whose childish dreams of freedom will, and were on page, soon disintegrated beneath the loving but controlling embrace of the Batman, annoyed at the world, ready to swindle any man, but not the Batman. No, the Batman can fix Ivy. So enamoured with a puppy-like crush, Ivy consistently overestimates her threat level and her power, and she gets distracted. And when she does, Batman is always there to show her the way. Ivy must be saved from her naivety. Her real power lies only in her femininity, in her ability to replicate the images associated with people like Betty Page, but not the human Betty Page, whose pretty shitty life I touched on earlier. Ivy is the ultimate deadly Aphrodite. Aphrodite, not only the goddess of sex and love and virility, but also Aphrodite Gravedigger. I don't think it will come to a surprise anyone when I say that second wave feminism in the US was very much disregarded as a girlish thing. For college students and rich girls who wanted to rebel against daddy by being a bitch, the real women of the 60s and 70s were supposed to be reflections of images of people like Jackie Kennedy, not Marilyn Monroe or Gloria Steinem. Ivy's early spout of activism, if you can call it that, her rebellion against so-called systems combined with her glamorous persona and her supposed lust for and lure over men, basically makes her Jane Fonda, or at least the Jane Fonda that people pretended existed 50 years ago. The Jane Fonda who was targeted by her own federal government for essentially being too woke. You have a two-year-old daughter, Vanessa. In what kind of a society do you think that she'd be living in, let's say about 18 or 15 years from now? Well, I would hope that she would be living in a, in a, in an unpolluted, Marxist, socialist country. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen that fast, to tell you the truth. And I don't know what the state of this country is going to be in 15 years. Ivy's earliest origin comes pretty late in pre-crisis. She's not used a lot. And it comes in a Wonder Woman issue of World's Finest, 12 years after her arrival into the DC Universe. Issues 251 and 252, written by Jerry Conway. And yeah, it's not a great story. It's sexist, it's kind of racist, and it's one where Ivy's agency in her own supervillain beginnings come into question. See, not only was Ivy a character created by men and written by men almost exclusively for the first 45 years of her story, but Poison Ivy, the persona, is also created by men within the narrative she exists in. In Wonder Woman 251 and 252, 
it is revealed Ivy was groomed by her professor, not Jason Woodrow in this first telling, but instead a man called Mark Legrand. Short story even shorter, Legrand tries to kill Ivy and it makes her immune to all poisons. Poison Ivy is born and in return she poisons him and turns him into some sort of Ent Hulk goon. She uses him as a weapon until one day after Ivy has an encounter with good old Steve and tries to kill him, Diana gets her own back by telling Monster Legrand all about how Ivy made him into the beast he is. He attempts to kill Ivy and Wonder Woman looks on like she saved the day, ignoring the fact that the only reason she is poison Ivy is because of Legrand's abuses in the first place. Ivy is essentially killed twice by the man who made her a monster. However, this second death is framed and the most disturbing part is that by Diana of all people as some sort of sweet romantic justice. It is not her that is a monster created by him, but he is a monster created by her. She is Dr. Frankenstein and man is her monstrous creation. This is also the story where we will be given a name for Poison Ivy for the first time, 12 years after her inception. Her name is revealed to be Lillian Rose. Lillian Lilith Subtle. Ivy in her earliest comics, coming up against Bruce and Dick, was always a threat, but a threat that would eventually be taken care of. She was never a threat to Batman himself. As Chuck Dixon said in a particularly on-the-nose fashion, she was the siren that could drive a wedge between Batman and Robin by luring Batman away. The bonds of brotherhood were not so fickle to be broken by a vamp. The bonds of sisterhood were a little rusty, however. Whilst there were a brief team-ups between Ivy and other women, Selina and Ivy's relationship is kind of a thing early on in the DC history. Although it's not very fleshed out, they kind of just stand next to each other. Ivy does tend to spend more time fighting against women than actually for them. Ivy is often seen to be jealous and vindictive towards other women, and she comes up against Diana quite a lot. The concept of feminism is non-existent, only represented through Ivy's persona, vaguely and aesthetically, and never through any action on the page. Diana, for a long time, and arguably still now, was DC's not like other girls queen. And not because she's literally not like other girls, because she's a god. Wonder Woman and Ivy are two sides of the same coin, often portrayed as polar opposites. Wonder Woman, a beacon of feminine decency in comparison to Ivy, who represents feminist delinquency. Ivy was also often shown to side with men, not only becoming the only token woman on villain teams, but also becoming submissive to not only male heroes, but male villains too. Again, the image of the maiden, the young lover, the deadly Aphrodite who will eventually be brought to her knees is pretty glaring through Silver Age Ivy's existence. Feminism, specifically the ecofeminism, was never really part of Ivy's story back then. The poison aesthetic was a nod to Hawthorne, and Ivy had yet to take on the more global fight for nature. She wasn't yet a fully fledged goddess. She was one in the making, and mostly, Mostly she was just sexy. A silly little girl with a playground crush who does what she does for Batman's attention and money. Not for any real moral cause. And Ivy's only personality trait being sexy at that point in her tenure is on purpose. It's because the oversexualization of women is a tool for infantilization. I wish I didn't have to say that, but the lolitification of female characters is something that we have all encountered at this point. I mean, Harley has pigtails for Christ's sake. Women are less deadly when they are sexualized because sexualization leads to one, infantilization, and two, objectification. Children and objects are non-threatening and they don't need rights. They need to be looked after by patriarchal men. And though Ivy remains a harlot compared to Wonder Woman, this first vision of Ivy is the most virginal of all her incarnations. Because she has no power, she is no real threat to the status quo, the most damsel in distress a villain can really be, before becoming an anti-hero like Selina. Unmarried and unlearned, she has not yet been totally ruined. Betty Page was a pin-up model, yes, but she was also famous for, and weirdly proud of, having not made any pornography. She was considered a safe harlot in comparison to, say, Linda Lovelace, who would come in the 70s. Linda Lovelace was a porn actress whose story is pretty comparable to Betty's, both even converting to Christianity after escaping the life of sex work on film, both meeting the same willowy faded end all mad women have if they don't die young. However, without going into a scarring amount of graphic detail, Linda's career was far more explicit than Page's. Betty Page was the maiden of porn stars. As Catherine McCormack notes in her book, Women in the Picture, Women, Art, and the Power of Looking, the Maiden is a frequent protagonist across the history of our images and the stories that underpin them, appearing in those made for pleasure and those made for politics, or sometimes both. Her body is young, 
powerless, sometimes sleeping, sometimes ill, dead or captured. And whatever happens to her almost always bolsters male identity or male virility. When the maiden isn't being abducted and raped by libidinous gods, an aesthetic pleasure is taken from her destruction and death. You might have seen her in religious paintings as the Virgin Martyr, more blessed and lovely when her beautiful body is mutilated. Or the hysterical young woman undone by love, whose tragedy we feast on in paintings and on the stage. She is Shakespeare's Juliet, or lovesick Ophelia. Like them, the maiden often does damage to herself through self-destruction or suicide. Ivy is definitely the latter. The self-destructive maiden who's longing for a man underpins all of her actions and emotions. And Ivy would stay within this character framework all the way up until the DC Universe rebooted itself in 1985 with the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover event. Well, there is a little foreshadowing pre-crisis, but we'll get into that later. Throughout all of her Silver Age appearances, it's hard to say Ivy is little more than cardboard. She appears in the Secret Society of Supervillains, she plays a background role in the chaos trying to lure Batman back into her loving arms. She turns up in World's Finest, Batman and JLA at one point, becoming the only female member of the Injustice Gang of the World. And again, every time she does, the same kind of story takes place. Ivy does something bad, usually poison, control or kill a man for money. Batman tracks her down, they will have a will they or won't they moment, and Bruce either catches Ivy and imprisons her, or she escapes until the next meeting. Batman's rogue gallery at this time all suffer this kind of gimmickry. They were all crazy social weirdos who wore costumes and had no real power. Villains, but not real threats. Ivy especially. She has no physical powers. She isn't a botanist, and she definitely isn't an eco-feminist. She can resist poisons. It's kind of useless. She might be a trope designed off of eco-feminists, an archetype of that image, and feminist generally at the time, but she is not a feminist in her actions or character. She is not a feminist at her core. Because why would she be? As I've said, she was entirely written by men at this point, and not like cool hip dudes, but like old, old, old men who were born in the first decade of the 20th century. They were not exactly feminists themselves, I'm not expecting them to be. And look, I've read hundreds of comics for this video, and the amount of times someone in the Silver Age DC Universe makes a quip about how women's liberation is getting too much, it's just a lot. And as I said, Ivy remains pretty flat. Her obsession with Batman and a separate grudge against Bruce Wayne is what fuels her. Well, that and money and fame. She wants to be rich and powerful, more powerful than the men that came before her, which I guess plays into a feminist narrative, or it could, but it doesn't, and Ivy is written as a bitter vamp who cares for no one, which echoes the theory that people like Berger and Mulvey laid out. I mean, Ivy didn't even have a real name in the beginning of the Silver Age. Both Lillian Rose and Pamela Isley are used at different points, but like a decade after Ivy had first been created. The first reference I found to Pamela Isley as a name relating to Ivy was in 1974, once, briefly, in issue 111 of JLA, when she first enjoined the Injustice Gang of the World. Between 66 and the beginning of the 80s, Ivy honestly only appears about 20 odd times, and there were hundreds, maybe even thousands of comics published in that space by DC. Outside of Batman love stories and teaming up with all male teams, Ivy appears in the Batman family as well, in one of her most interesting early stories, if you ask me, where we see her team up with Selina and fight against the OG Kathy Kane, Babs, and Earth 2 Helena, who for those that don't know, Earth 2 Helena was originally Selina and Bruce's daughter from another world and not Helena Bertolini. DC Comics is complicated, man. Ivy also shows up in Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane, where she is hired by the 100 to hunt down Thorn. Yeah, remember Thorn? That also could have been an interesting story, but it wasn't. It isn't until we reach her Legrand origins in a Wonder Woman issue of World's Finest that we begin to see any real character development for Ivy. As the 80s came and feminism changed, the perception of women, especially in the US, especially in media, would also change too, and Ivy would not escape the coming post-feminist diatribe and arrival of a whole new set of standards, beliefs, and expectations for and within feminist and women-based culture. And Ivy's early maiden image is only amplified by her relationship with Batman in the Silver Age. Another archetype I want to talk about, one that is used within Gotham and Batman and Ivy's relationship a lot, one that extends out of the maiden archetype, and that is in a lot of capital R romantic art, is that of Death and the Maiden. Reminiscent of the Dance Macabre, the dance with death motif that was popular in medieval art, the once femme fatale, and yes, all the men that painted Death and the Maiden motifs also seem to enjoy painting femme fatale motifs, this once femme fatale finds a lover in Death himself, and just comparing images of Batman and Ivy with either femme fatales and their victims, or femme fatales and their deadly lovers, you can see similarities quickly. The contrast of a dark and deathly man to the fire of an unholy woman, the male death 
that will ultimately placate female death, the death that is more powerful. This is something I think is increased even more, like I said, over the next era of Ivy's stories, so we'll talk about it more in the next video. But Batman and Ivy are both vampires, each other's vampires, sucking the life force from each other, him surviving in the dark, her surviving in the light. She is the deadly black widow, and he is lord of the underworld. And look, I love Batcat and Harl Ivy, if you know anything about me, but damn, could Ivy and Bruce have had the most interesting relationship in DC Comics if someone had ever been allowed to explore it properly. It is in Ivy's final pre-crisis appearances where the seeds, pun intended, are scattered for the coming of a new Ivy, one that lays the groundwork far more firmly for the Ivy that we see today. As her maiden era comes to a close alongside the Silver Age, Ivy is reborn, as all goddesses are. She will shed the proverbial snake skin, becoming more powerful and more deadly with every coming appearance no longer a maid off track that can be salvaged. Ivy becomes an outcast in a city full of outcasts. Like Batman, morality weighs heavy on the new Ivy, and her biblical war against the horrors of humanity increases tenfold. The 80s and the 90s, and the writers who had Ivy throughout that period, arguably had the most dramatic influence on her character as a whole. However, this is all best left for part two. For now, part one shall come to an end. Please join me next time for a new chapter in this discussion on goddesses in Gotham, where we will explore Ivy's mother era, the complicated history of post-feminism and the third wave, the mess of Batman and Robin, bisexuality, and Neil Gaiman. So much Neil Gaiman. Oh, and the ever so wonderful Harley Quinn might just be making an appearance or two for what is the history of Ivy without a mention of Harley or two. So yeah, this has been the opening and part one of Poison Ivy, a feminist goddess through a male gaze. Ivy is maiden and the second wave. My name is Mage, and this has been Black and White Thinking.